Welcome back. Here we are again in Genesis and going through uh, the book of Genesis. And um, we went through chapters 1 and 2 now, and today we'll be looking at chapter 3, um, a very important book of not only of the book of Genesis, but um, to understand the spiritual state of man and the promise of a Redeemer. And we're going to be looking at the, the fall, specifically here in, in Genesis chapter 3. But before we do, let's pray. And uh, the Lord, to just to give us wisdom and understanding in His Scripture. Lord Jesus, we do thank You so much for Your Word and just how great it is um, to our hearts, to our minds, to our souls. And Lord, we just pray for Your Spirit to, to come and be present with us. Even though this is through a recording, may you still speak. May you speak to those who are watching, who are listening, Lord. May you speak through me by the power of your spirit and through your word, Lord, we pray. In your name, amen. So from the beginning, we looked at, you know, the, of the Bible, we see this, this uh, uh, amazing creative God and how he, was, he created the heavens in the earth and the, the vastness of the of the universe um, we looked at last time just displaying God's majesty and his glory and however the even more amazing thing that we see from the very beginning is that God is a relational God even though that he has such great power to create all of this out of nothing he wants to have relation with his creation you know, Genesis 1, God referred, he's referred to as Elohim, signifying him as a sovereign creator. In Genesis 2, we see God referred to as the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, his covenant building relational name. And it just shows that God wants to have a relationship with mankind. And that's important as we jump into Genesis 3, and we'll see why in, in a little bit. But just to remind you that in the first 11 chapters, the history of the world, it can be broken up into five stories. Here's the first one. We have the fall, um, and then we're going to have Cain, then the sons of God marrying the daughters of men, or daughters of man, and then we have the flood and the tower of Babel. So the, the, the history of the world is pretty much broken into those five stories, and this is the first one, the fall. And we're still in the, 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 the first um, generation of aspect of Genesis, and we'll, we'll continue through that and explain what I mean as we, as we progress through. But remember, the book of Genesis is broken into 11 parts as far as where it states, this is the generation of. And here we're in that, that first one um, all the way until Genesis 4. But each of the five stories that I mentioned there's a four-part structure to them. Sin is described, and, and then God gives a speech announcing the penalty of sin, and then God brings grace into that situation, and then God punishes the sin. In, in this passage that we're going to look at, we see the fall of man. In 1 through 13, we see sin, especially in verse 6. You know, And then 14 through 19, we see God gives a speech. 20 and 21, we see the grace of God, and then the rest of that, we see the judgment upon Adam and Eve and uh, how they are exiled from the garden. But you, you, wherever we see God's judgment in Scripture, it is accompanied very closely to His grace, the grace and mercy. And God's justice is always tempered with mercy and grace. And we see that, that God makes provision for man to come back into fellowship with him, because that's his desire, is to have a relationship with you and me. God makes going to make a covering for sin, and we see that that picture and that 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 uh, that basically a, a, an anticipation for when Jesus covers, or not just covers, but pays for our sins completely. See, the Garden of, of Eden was a, a perfect place for man to commune with God. And into that perfect environment, we're going to see, came an intruder, an adversary. 
whose very purpose was to exalt himself above God. His purpose, he desired to be above God and to discredit God by destroying the moral purity of God's creation. And if Satan could get God's prized creation to worship him, then he thought that he could finally beat God. Well, let's look at this. Genesis 3, 1, we see, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So first, who is the serpent? You know, well, it's it's Satan here. And in, in what does his name mean? His name means accuser or, or, or adversary. And Satan is a fallen angel. He, he led a rebellion against God and was cast out of, of God's presence along with a third of the angels. Turn with me, if you will, to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. We're going to look at a couple scriptures that give us an idea of, of, of Satan and his fall and just a little bit of a background. don't want to spend too much time looking at our great enemy, but it is important in this aspect. Chapter 28 of the prophet Ezekiel, beginning in verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord, sorry, word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with, with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub. From the midst of the fiery stones, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You know, most believe that this is describing Satan. And Satan was given an exalted place. He was, he was in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God. And Eden was the epitome of God's you know, beautiful creation on earth. And, and Satan's beauty matched that of Eden, and, and every precious stone, you know, was there to uh, to adore him, and to were adorned. It, it did adorn him. It, 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 Ezekiel listed here nine gemstones in describing Satan's beauty, and, and these were nine of the twelve kinds of stones that were in the breastplate of of Israel's high priest. But these precious stones symbolized, you know, Satan's beauty and his high position that he that he had. And, and God had anointed, uh, anointed Satan as a, as, a, as a guardian cherub, as we see in Ezekiel 28. And the, and the cherubim were the, the inner circle of angels, if you will, who had the, the closest access to God and were, were they, they were there and um, were, were surrounding his holiness. Satan also had free access to God's holy mount, we see in verse 14, the heaven, and he, he walked, uh, he walked in, that, in that space. As originally he was created by God, Satan was blameless. Till, as it's mentioned here in verse 15 and 16, wickedness was found in him. He sinned, you know, and the, the, the sin that was in Satan was self-generated. He was created blameless. His sin, as we learn from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, was pride. And it was, it was because of his, of his beauty. He was prideful in how, he, how beautiful he was created. And he spoiled his wisdom. He spoiled his wisdom and his pride led to his fall and eventually his judgment. Turn with me to another 
great prophet, Isaiah. And we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 14 to give us a little more insight into, into this character that we, that we see entering in to Genesis chapter 3. We're starting uh, Isaiah and starting in verse chapter 14, and we'll look at verse 12. All right, Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest pits of the pit. And those who see will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? And continues on. But you see there how he was so uh, determined. You see how many times it uses the, 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 the word I and just the pride of Lucifer. But we know, again, that Satan is a created being. His desire was to, to discredit and overthrow God. And he is a defeated foe, thanks to the Lord Jesus. But the execution of his judgment has been postponed in, in, in God's providence until we have um, the, the Lord coming back in the, the millennial kingdom reign. But he may appear, being Satan may appear to be in control, but his ways are being turned to good. By God, And we see Romans 8.28, we see the story of, of Joseph as well, as we'll get to that at the end of, this, um, end of this book. But Satan's great tactics, which we are going to see throughout this dialogue, are, all, are here. We're going to see that they're all about deceit and they're false accusations. And we're going to see that he, he does that throughout our, our dialogue with Eve in chapter 3. And, see, and sin's chief characteristic... Um, of all of all mankind, the, the, key, the chief characteristic of sin for us is deceitfulness. It is not what it appears, and it promises what it can never deliver. And, and that's, that's sin. It, 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 it's not what it appears, and it promises what it cannot deliver. Because sin is, if we can define some of what sin is, missing the mark. It's an independence from God transgression of God's law, a violation from, from God's holy character and standards. It's a, a moral depravity, a falling short of God's glory, rebellion against God. It's disobeying the Lord. And how could an all-perfect good God create something like sin? We hear that question a lot. That question, well, why did God ever create sin? Why did he put sin? Well, he didn't. You know, it is not a created thing. Sin is not a created thing. It is the absence of what is good. It's a result of man's free will to, to choose to disobey. And the Bible commands us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. In this passage, we're going to see what those devices are, how he works, because his devices haven't changed. They're still the same. And in this passage in chapter 3, we're going to see five times that Satan challenges God. You know, look at that verse again. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Notice first that Satan challenges the nature of God. Okay, and very specifically here, we notice uh, something. What do you notice about how he refers to God in verse one, as opposed to how God refers to Himself? All right. Now read it again. Now the Lord, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And what does Satan say? Has has God indeed said? Okay, Satan here avoids the use of God's covenant name, the Lord. 
he he avoids Yahweh. He re avoids the 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 covenant relational name. Chapter one, we see again Elohim, and in chapter two, Yahweh Elohim, and it's used from chapter two all the way to chapter four, except in these first five verses of Genesis three. Satan removes and tries to remove the relational aspect of God, the very deceitful, very tricky aspect of our of our enemy, removing the relational aspect of God because he, the, the scriptures mention Lord God pointing to relational. He wants to have a relationship. He wants to have that communication back and forth. But Satan refers to him as just God, referring to him basically in implying that he's out of touch that we cannot be in touch with him. The devil wants you and I to believe that we're just one of many creations. Because if he is just the creator, there is no relationship. But remember back to Genesis 1 and 2, we are made in the image of God. We're set apart from all other creations. We're able to connect with God because of that, and he is able to connect with us that no other creation is able to. So Satan is trying to remove that relational aspect because if that relational aspect exists, we are then able to draw in on the power and the strength and the ability of the Lord. And Satan tries to attack that. The second challenge that God, that the, the Satan challenges God, and we see that. Satan challenges the word of God. Remember back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. What do we see here in verse 1? It says, Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You see here, Satan turns a positive invitation and a blessing into a negative prohibition by changing the wording. Satan challenges God's love by implying, he's saying, would a God of love keep something from you? And you look at this, it says, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the, of the garden? But what did Jesus say? What did the Lord say? God said to Adam, you may eat of every tree of the garden, or of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. And Satan takes those words very deceitfully, and he says, has God said that you can't eat of every tree of the garden? And you see, here, the attack on God's word. The fact that he's not really loving. And we have to be very careful in how the enemy uses words to deceive us. Because the attack on God's word is crucial. It leads to so many other issues. Again, we mentioned that from the beginning, God wants to be and is a relational God. But if we don't have his words, and his words are attacked, and his words can't be trusted... We now can't have a relationship with him. Because in order to have a relationship, there must be words exchanged, thoughts exchanged, minds, characters, hearts exchanged. And if God isn't personal, does God really speak? If we move the Yahweh aspect of God, he's, he's, he's not even relational. He's out of touch. And we see that in our world today. And we even ask the question, why do God's words even matter? Is there such thing as God's words? Does he speak today? Is it, is it, does it really matter? Can God's words be trusted? And you see that attack that Satan makes on God's word that is designed to reveal himself to mankind. Third, Satan challenges the intent of God. See, Satan wants you to believe that God isn't for you. But do you truly know, he asks, do you really know the heart or intent of God? See, God created everything, this earth, in order for man to have all that he needs to live a fulfilling and fruitful life. Everything around us 
is so our life can be sustained. Remember that he continues here to refer to himself as Lord God. He desires, God does, desires an unbroken relationship with Adam, and he desires a relationship with you and me. And Satan comes and says, do you really know the intent of God? Are you really sure you understand the heart of God? Continue with me in verses 2 and 3. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. See, Eve here minimizes the blessings and maximizes the repercussions. God said, You may eat out of every tree freely, meaning enjoy it completely, enjoy everything abundantly without limit. Just don't eat this one tree. Here we see Eve, she minimizes the free blessing of enjoying everything without limit. She leaves out that they can eat of every tree, but she also adds the aspect of not being able to touch it. So she, she minimizes the blessings and maximizes the repercussions. How often do we do that very thing? But Satan wants to minimize God's blessings in our life. He wants to maximize the consequences or repercussions that happen if we do not do something. He wants you to believe that God's intentions for you are not good. Can I say again that God desires for our good? He desires for things that will benefit us, that will bless us, and he's willing to use anything to get us to that very place that he knows we need to be in order to be successful. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, and it's something that, it's a very dear psalm to me. Let's read just the first four verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. See, we see here, it's talking about how can a, how, what is a blessed man like? And that word blessed is happiness. And we see that happiness is conditional. It's something that you do not do. And it, it, we see here that the, that the word of God is, has a purpose. And it says that, uh, that the blessed man delights in the word of God. Now, it mentions the law of God. And we have an idea in our mind, and this is where we're coming from as far as the, 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 the uh, prohibitions of, of law. We think of a law, we think of prohibitions. It's something that I cannot do. The government sets a law that the people cannot break or they have to suffer consequences. You know, we think of uh, speed limits. You know, it's preventing us from going over a certain speed. And, and, and for the most part, our laws prevent actions. But the law, and the Hebrew word for that, Torah, means instructions and directions. See, God's law, the law of the Lord, is directions, a directing us to the proper way of life. So we will lead and live a good life. It's guiding and leading of our, of our Creator and how to live life properly. Most importantly, it reveals to us who God truly is in order to have a relationship with Him. It is our instruction manual, if you will, in order to live a fruitful, good life, the way our Creator designed us to be. Now, a lot of us don't read instructions. We buy something and just dive right in. And a lot of us live life that way as well. 
We don't read the instruction manual of life. We just want to dive right in. Oh, just live life to the fullest, man. Don't worry about it. Oh, may we take the time to desire the law of the Lord. Because it's in that desire that we find true life. The word, the instructions of God. Do you have a desire, a passion for the word of God? The instructions from your creator that will develop and show you who he is to develop that relationship with him that will lead you to a fruitful life. Because the blessed man finds unspeakable joy in God's word. Now, some do not like the law of the Lord because they aren't humble enough to be taught. It is his instruction and some do not want to be told what to do. They focus on what he tells them not to do instead of the instructions that he leads them to the blessings of life. Psalm 1 also tells us here to, to meditate, to not leave the word of God from your mind. Do not let it leave your mind day or night. Keep it there. What value does God's word have in your in your life? And we're going to see the whole the whole importance of God's word in temptation. And we're going to see this as we go through this passage. But you see in verse 3 of Psalm 1 that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The blessed man, the one who desires God's word. And here we see one who is planted by the, the rivers of water, a tree that is fruitful and has deep roots and is able to not only sustain the elements and, and be able to sustain the winds that may come, but also be fruitful. It would be fruitful in its season. When it needs to produce a certain fruit, it produces the fruit that it was intended to produce in its season. Now, we must be careful with this time as far as allowing the roots to grow deep into our spiritual life so we can sustain temptation. And we see that in the end of verse 3 where, you know, one who is planted by the river, their leaves will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. And we see Joshua given these commands about not leaving the word of God as he is getting ready to go in and conquer the promised land, much to be afraid of, much to be distracted by, much to be tempted with. Joshua 1, 7 and 8, Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law of which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Prosperous. The thing that, uh, it's, it's accomplishing the thing that you were set out to do. And this may involve difficulty, but the work God gives us to do, He places and He plants us, up, plants us in a place and, he'll, and he allows us and gives us the ability to do that very work. And as we are planted by the rivers, we are able to, to sustain the difficulty and our, our leaves will not wither, as the psalm says here. But look, at it says the wicked are like chaff. They're blown by the wind. You know, and the reason why I brought us to this psalm is because here we have the temptation of the, of, of Satan. And he's using God's word to twist and deceive. We need to have a desire for God's word so we know God's word and that he would write it on our heart that we will not sin against him. Because my prayer for myself and for, for all of us is that we won't be blown like the wind, like blown by the wind of the ways of the world. That we will have roots that are stable and strong in the Lord to allow us to overcome. Because the word of God provides an anchor. And the enemy knows this. And that's why he's attacking the very words of God from the beginning. Because the word of God provides an anchor for man's soul and man's heart. And the life of a righteous man is marked 
by strength and stability in God's Word and in a relationship with God. Two things that we need to hold very closely to and invest our lives in and, and hold very dear to our hearts. They equip us and allow us to overcome temptation, which we'll get to in a minute. As we continue, we've seen already three of the ways that Satan has challenged the, 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 the has challenged God. Look at verse 4. Uh, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the fourth way that Satan challenges God, he challenges the accuracy of God. Right here, Satan lies and says, you will not die. God's not accurate. He's not right. Here we see Satan blaming God. Blaming God and removing all consequences for one's actions. Oh, God doesn't know. God's not right. And we see that today where people in society are blame shifters. They don't take the responsibility for their own actions. It's always someone else's fault or there's always a reason for what they did. Instead of owning up to what they did, accepting the consequences and seeking forgiveness and repentance. We must take responsibility for our actions. Here he's accusing God of being a liar. And God's goodness, he's attacking God's goodness, and we know through scripture that God cannot lie. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent, as he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? See, we need to hold on to the promises of God and allow God to show himself faithful because he always has and always will. And it's in there that we continue to hold true to the word of God that it will be fulfilled, that he will be true to his word. But here Satan attacks the accuracy of God. And then finally, fifth, Satan challenges the supremacy of God. Satan here says in verses 4 and 5, he says, if you eat, you won't die. You're going to be like God. And God doesn't want you to be like him. According to Satan, the threat of death was nothing more than a scare tactic to keep Adam and Eve in their place. To keep them at bay. He's declaring to Eve and to us that God is holding something back from you and me. We know that that's not the truth. It's so far from the truth. Well, we see he doesn't even keep his own son. He gives us his son so we would have life and life abundantly. Verses 6 and 7. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. You know, in First John chapter 2, verse 16, the apostle summarizes temptation in three ways. He says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life it is not the Father, but is of the world. And we see how he summarizes temptation in those three different ways. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And Eve faced all three, and she allowed the temptation to build in her mind. Eve saw that the tree was good for food. It was physically appealing. She saw or saw that it was a delight to the eye. It was visually appealing. And it was desired to make one wise. The pride of life. In this temptation, it was wisdom apart from God. The great temptation. You know, the important thing here that we must remember about temptation is where is the battle lost or won? It's in the mind. 
It's at the thought level. James 1, chapter, sorry, James 1, verse 13 and 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. See, taking and eating were a foregone conclusion once the thought in her mind became lust. Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes in his book, Temptation, just how temptation works. Listen to this quote. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. It makes no difference whether it is sexual desire, ambition, vanity, desire for revenge, love of fame and power, or greed for money. Joy is extinguished in us, and we seek all our joy in the creature. At this point, God is quite unreal to us. He loses all reality, and only desire for the creature is real. Satan does not fill us with hatred for God, but with forgetfulness of God. The lust aroused envelopes the mind in the will of man in deepest darkness. The powers of clear discrimination and decision are taken from us. The questions present themselves, is what the flesh desires really sin? Is it really not permitted? It is here that everything within me rises up against the word of God. Now, do you see how it's the, 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 the battle of temptation is won by the mind? It's why Paul says to take all thoughts captive. To what? To the word of God. To allow the word of God to show us and to give us victory in the areas of temptation. Because when temptation comes, it doesn't come in the form of ugliness. Otherwise, it wouldn't be very tempting, would it? You know, Satan disguises himself as the angel of light. And some people may ask, how could an all-perfect God, again, create sin? And I mentioned earlier, he didn't. It was the fact that Adam and Eve chose to disobey. Choosing disobedience leads to sin. Notice... We don't see Adam mentioned in the interaction between the serpent and Eve. He doesn't speak up. Yeah. Satan addressed Eve with the plural, you. you know, some would say, well, Adam wasn't there. Well, the plural form of you that Satan uses shows us, it implies that Adam was there. But here Adam is, passively watching everything. And when he's mentioned in verse 6, it is only as her husband. Can I share also with you here that as 1 Timothy 2.14 tells us, Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived, but Adam was. Who did God give the direction not to eat to? He gave it to Adam. Adam sinned willfully without hesitation. He watched Eve take the fruit. Nothing happened to her. And he sinned willfully, assuming there would be no consequences. Eve was deceived by the serpent. Adam sinned willfully. And here in this situation, we see everything is upside down. Eve follows the snake. Adam follows Eve. And nobody is following God. I want to pause here for this in the story of Genesis and just look at how we can receive or we can have victory over temptation. Now this in no way is a is intended to be an exhaustive list of what you can do to have victory over sin, but I think it's a great starting place for us. And I've already mentioned before the first one. We start in God's Word. In Psalm 119.11, your word I have written in my heart that I may not sin against you. The, the, the place that God's word has in your heart will be related to the ability that you and I have to recognize and flee temptation. 
We know that Jesus hated temptation, or sorry, hated, handled temptation. He probably hated it too, but he handled temptation with, with, the, word of, with the word of God. He knew what the word said, and he stood on what it said. You know, turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to see this very aspect of Jesus meeting the temptation of Satan with the word of God. This is, this is Jesus. This is Jesus, God in flesh. But here we go, starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up to the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Okay? Showing the, the humanity of Jesus. And look how, look how the enemy tempts him. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Notice, he's playing here, declaring, recognizing that he is the Son of God. But you have the ability, you're hungry, just make these stones bread. And you can eat. Your, your desire, your, your fleshly need will be met. But look how he answers in verse 4. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus pointing to the spiritual need over the physical. Verse 5, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Again, well, you can jump off and nothing will happen. You'll be saved. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. In verse 8, Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Notice, Satan offers him all the land that he can see. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. We see the Lord answering the enemy with the word of God. The second thing that we can do is prayer. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We must realize that our flesh is weak and, and seek the Lord's strength through prayer, just like our Lord did. Part of the Lord's prayer had to do with temptation. Matthew 6, 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, showing us the pattern of prayer, showing us the need for prayer during temptation. And it should be a, a part of our daily discipline to recognize that we're going to be tempted and be asking God for help in that temptation. Now, Eve could have called out to God for help, and she would have received it instantly. But instead, she tried to handle it in her own strength, in her own ways. And we know that, that Adam was silent throughout the entire time. The third thing that we can defeat temptation is location. Don't hang out in the places or with the people that bring great temptation in your life. Proverbs 26, sorry, Proverbs 6, 27 and 28. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? The author of the proverb is saying here, you play with fire, you're going to get burnt. So if you're tempted in certain areas or people lead you into temptation in certain ways, avoid them. Avoid them. Fourth, flee. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape 
that you may be able to bear it. God will always provide a way of escape. An escape implies that you're going to walk away from the temptation. You take an exit. And the great example of it, we'll get there eventually in Genesis 39, when Joseph was working for Potiphar in Egypt, and Potiphar's wife began to hit on Joseph. A day came when he was in the house alone, and she came up, grabbed him by the coat, and said, lie with me. Joseph didn't take time to talk this out. He left his coat and ran away. He fled. He was, there was temptation there. Obviously, she was a, an attractive woman. She, he fled out the door, not allowing any room for temptation to occur. Fleeing is part of our weapon, if you will, against temptation. Here we see in, 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 in Scripture where it says that their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked. Excuse me one second. Just going to... Allergies, sorry. Their eyes were open and they realized that they were naked. You know, they, they, how do you... And this is a question when you're, when, you're, when you're reading these scriptures is you wonder, how do you all of a sudden just realize that you're naked? <laughs> but the, 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 the reason being is because up to this point... They have not been self-focused. Up to this point, they have been selfless. And now we have sin entering the world, entering into man. And there is this deep self-conscious awareness that overcomes them of who they are. And it's still a part of us. And boy, do we see it today. It's why we worry about what we look like when we go out. It's why we have mirrors in the house and in our gyms. And men, yes, you're actually, we are actually worse at this than women. It is why we can always tell when we have gained weight. We have a very self-conscious part of our life now because of sin. And we were never meant to experience this. You know, Adam and Eve were the only humans ever not to be driven by the flesh. They were the only humans to ever know what it was like to live a life without sin. Jesus excluded, of course. But we are spiritual beings meant to be connected with the Lord. But when they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, self became the primary focus. Self-awareness, self-conscious, self-sufficient, self-righteous, and self-preservation. Self became the main focus when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we, we see these in the fact that they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. It became all about self and they tried to fix the problem by themselves. The problem is they can't fix it. Don't know if you know this, but fig leaves are extremely itchy. So here they are. They take the, the, the fig leaf, the worst possible thing that they could take to try to cover themselves with and use as a covering. And what does it do? They try to fix themselves and all it does is it draws attention to the very thing that they were trying to cover. We try to fix ourselves with all of our, our self-help techniques of today. And the issue is it only draws attention to the very thing that we're trying to fix. The best thing a human can realize is, I need help. I need help. Lord, help me. And he will. We cannot fix ourselves. But we have a great Savior who has offered to help, to come. All those who are heavy laden, come. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? 
So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So here we have the Garden of Eden, the special place of God's presence on earth. And much like the, 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 the tabernacle and then later on the temple. And here we have the word walk. The word walk and how the, the word for walk in Hebrew means to move amongst, to be at ease, or to be in a conversation with. God had a special time during the day that he would walk with Adam and Eve. And we see scripture in Amos 3.3 that says, The two cannot walk together unless they're in agreement. And Adam had an unbroken relationship that they were in agreement with God. And that is broken. What does it mean for you today to have a walk with God? What does your walk with God look like? Is it daily? As is described here, the the daily walk that Adam had with God What does your walk with God look like? God desires to be, he is a relational God and desires to have a relationship with you and wants to have that daily connection with you. What does that look like? Here, Adam and Eve have sinned and we see them hiding from God. Sin is ugly and we have to realize how ugly sin is. Sin is ugly and it causes one to hide from the presence of God. Because sin cannot stand in the holiness and in the, the bright light of God. And what a delusion for anyone then or today to imagine it is possible to hide from God. We see that God comes and he says, where are you? And we know that God knew where he was. But we see Psalm 139, verse 7, it's, the psalmist is writing and he says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are here. You are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. You can't hide from God. And furthermore, why should we? Come. Come to him. But sin brings shame and guilt. And we may try to hide it or to bury it or so nobody else can see it, but the Lord can see it. We can try to cover it up and wear our, our figurative masks in order to cover things up, but the Lord sees it. And he wants it brought to the light. He wants us to bring it to the light, admit that we need forgiveness, and he promises when we do, when we come in repentance, that he will forgive our sins. Our sins will be forgiven as far as from the east as from the west. It's that peace and freedom that he offers. That you will no longer be bound by the, by the guilt and shame of your sin. I will forgive you and I will, I will declare them forgiven where I won't even remember them. But we need to bring them to the light. The enemy wants us to keep them in the darkness so they cannot be de- handled with. And it will continue to be bound by our guilt and shame. But God wants them to be brought to the light so he can deal with them and bring forgiveness and healing and restoration. And that's why he goes looking, if you will, because he knew where Adam was and wanted Adam to respond so he could bring Adam to an opportunity of repentance. So God, in verse 9, calls out for Adam. And even after Adam and Eve sinned, God continued to seek after them. The the where you are that that God asks is really, why are you there? We know that God knew exactly where they were. But God is hoping Adam would come to him and confess what he's done. But the beautiful thing is, we just know that Adam has brought sin into the world, 
has affected God's creation. You could say that Adam and Eve have destroyed everything. But if you can think about the fact, here he is, he still goes and he seeks after Adam and Eve. He seeks after Adam and Eve after their sin. And what a beautiful picture we have here of God seeking after broken man. Giving God, giving Adam an opportunity to repent. But separation here from God was the first judgment of sin. We have the separation that Adam now experienced from God. We are made up, and a little reminder, we're made up of three parts. You know, the spirit, soul, and, and, and body. And, and the fact that we have a spirit separates us from the rest of creation. When Adam and Eve sinned, the spirit died and was rendered inoperative. Even though they were still alive physically, they're separated from God because their spirit is not alive. Which is why we have the need to be born again. Notice that here, Adam didn't die physically right away. But he was dead as far as his spirit connection with God. Verse 10, notice Adam's response makes no admission of wrong. He was more aware of his nakedness and shame than his sin against God. And the only thing that he truly confessed to was a feeling of fear. He's so self-focused, he's in a so self-focused state that he was more focused on how he felt than the fact that he had sinned against God. All I fear is all I feel is fear. I'm afraid. And we see verses 11 through 13, nothing but excuses are given. Adam's excuse. We see Adam's excuse in here. And we see this very thing in verse uh, 13. I'm sorry, in verse 12. Then man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Who did Adam blame? Some would say, oh, of course, he, he blamed Eve. Read it again. He says, it's the woman you gave me. He's blaming God for this. These are the words of a spiritually dead man blaming God. Basically, if you wouldn't have given me Eve, I wouldn't have eaten. It's a spiritually dead man. We see Eve's excuse. She says, I was deceived by the serpent. She's passing the buck. She's blame, blame shifting instead of accepting her responsibility for her actions. Now, you may be in a place where you have messed up your life. You may feel, I've messed up my life. I've messed up my relationship with the Lord. Look at Adam and Eve. They messed up everyone's life. They're the only humans to ever live free from sin other than Jesus. How would you have reacted and treated Adam and Eve when they sinned and ate the fruit of the tree of garden and garden the tree of good and evil? Would you have reacted with judgment? Maybe anger, maybe resentment? Would you have abandoned them? Can I say that if you're in a state where you feel that you've ruined your life, you look at Adam and Eve and you see that God did not abandon them. God pursued them, came to them and said, where are you? And basically asking, why are you there? Come back to me. Come back. How do you respond to God's invitation? Romans 5.17 for if by the man, by if one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, he offers me and you forgiveness. And he says, why are you there? Come, enjoy the gift of forgiveness. Enjoy, repent of your sins and come and receive life and life abundantly. 
the beautiful nature of our God. Verse 14. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your, con and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Verses 14 and 15, we see the curse on animals and on Satan. Okay, the Animals and on Satan. In verse 15, we see the curse on Satan specifically. First mention of the gospel here is given in Genesis 3.15. The great news pronouncing Satan's final defeat in Christ as the, the seed of woman would deal Satan a death blow. At the cross, he would deal Satan a death blow. While Satan would only bruise Christ's heel with the physical death, Jesus would conquer death and defeat Satan. And who is that seed that is talked about here? Well, we know it's Jesus, and specifically from Gal Galatians 3.16, we know that even clearer, but he's talking about Jesus here. And it's interesting that it isn't between the man's offspring and the snake's offspring, but the woman. See, Jesus had an earthly mother, but not an earthly father. And when Jesus was on the cross, Satan bruised his heel. But when Jesus died on the cross, he bruised the head of Satan. Conquering, taking the sins of the world upon himself and conquering death and delivering that death blow to Satan. The fulfillment of this prophecy is seen at the cross. It's why throughout history we have seen and throughout the Bible we've seen such an attack on the line of Jesus because Satan knows that if it stop, stops that line, he'll stop his punishment. He'll stop his judgment. But God is sovereign. And he sees it through to the day where Jesus goes to the cross. Verse 16, we see the curse on Eve and Adam. We see the woman's desire would be much like the desire of sin to master Cain, which we're going to see later on. The same word used in, in, in Genesis 4, 7, where God says to Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. The, the woman would now desire to control her husband, but she would fail because God has ordained that man should lead. That man should lead. And we see that man didn't lead in this whole conversation by not speaking up. And if man would have stepped up and led, he could have prevented his wife from being deceived. In Galatians 3.20, we will see that Adam exercises leadership by naming Eve. And we'll see that as we read it in a, in a few minutes. But the curse of, of woman would come in the moment of the greatest blessing of their life. We see through marriage and children is through the, how the curse is going to be seen. She will be found wanting if she expects to be fulfilled by marriage. And marriage is a beautiful thing, but men and women would say that it, it can't be my fulfillment. I can only be fulfilled in Jesus. I love my, 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 my wife, but it's through the Lord that I am fulfilled. And it's by a gift that he has given me in a beautiful wife, and a wonderful wife, that I am a better man than I was before I was married because of the work that he's done in me through her. And here we also see how she, the woman will be cursed through pain in childbirth. But this is actually the grace of God because these things will drive the woman to God. Yeah, she'll have some pain, but those things will go and drive her to God. 
Submission was not an issue before the fall. Adam and Eve were submitted to God. Eve submitted to Adam. But once focus on self is enhanced and brought in by sin, this is where submission became a problem. And we see in Ephesians 5 where submission in Christ to one another. First to the Lord and then to one another. It's by sin that submission became a problem because of our self-focus that has arisen. Which is why the desire for us to be spiritually led and to be selfless is, is a goal for all believers. It's fascinating also how the, the New Testament commands for a husband and wife compare with this curse. You know, you look at Ephesians 5.22 and it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And the curse has man ruling over his wife and Jesus wants women to learn to handle the curse by submitting. By submitting. She wants to have, by, she wants to have a desire to rule over him. And the curse can be handled, the, the, the temptation can be handled by submitting to the Lord, by submitting to their husbands. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. See, the curse involved a desire of the woman for her husband. And Jesus matches the curse by commanding the husbands to love their wives like he loves the church. And, and, and to make the marriage complete, the husband needs to, to work at loving his wife like Jesus loves the church. And that's impossible un unless one is submitted to the work of Jesus in their life. The husband needs to learn to sacrifice for his wife. The husband needs to learn to nurture and build up his wife as, the, as Christ does the church. Now, these, these punishments represent uh, retaliatory justice, if you will. Adam and Eve sinned by eating, and they would suffer now in order to eat. And we're going to see that further on as we read. But God has made gracious provisions in the fact that ultimate victory will come in the seed of the woman. You know, the the, the Eve manipulated her husband and she would be mastered by her husband. And the serpent destroyed the human race and he will be destroyed by Jesus, the seed of the woman. Continuing in verse 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat it, cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it. All the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So the earth here is cursed due to the sin of man. And, and, and fruit will still be produced, but only in the presence of thorns and thistles. It's interesting how Jesus is crowned with thorns and thistles at his death. Toil now enters the world, making work much more difficult than before. For those, just a reminder that work did exist before the fall, but now toil enters the world, making it more difficult. 20 and 21, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. So here, Adam names Eve, which means living. It names her living in the face of pronounced death. Okay, And the name Eve celebrates the survival of, of human race and, and victory over death. And you go on and you look at verse 21 and you ask the question, where did God get the animal skins to make tunics? And the implication is God performed a sacrifice. God's sacrifice brought a covering for man's sin. 
and we see this first picture of a sacrifice, blood being required for the removal and the submit and, and the, the, the the forgiveness of sins. But even in judgment, here we see that the, the, he brings judgment upon the the Adam and Eve. We also see God's mercy and grace connected right to it. God makes a covering for sin by sacrificing the blood of an animal. He used the skins to clothe them and to cover Adam and Eve. Now remember, they tried to cover themselves. They tried to fix themselves, and they failed. They failed. Forgiveness requires blood. And here, Jesus, or the Lord offers a substitutionary sacrifice, if you will, the picture of what's to come eventually in Jesus to cover their sins. And God in his mercy does for man what he could not do for himself and provide a covering. Turn with me briefly as we begin to close. Um, it's always the process for a, a pastor to close a Bible study. Um, as we begin to close, look at Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sacrifices for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And here we see the picture, and eventually you're going to see that we know about the, the sacrifices in the temple. But you see this, this in Hebrews, if the, the blood of animals, how much more does the blood, the perfect blood of the Lamb of God, of Jesus, the spotless Lamb, bring forgiveness to us? And this is where Jesus, being our great high priest, offering up himself to the Holy of Holies into the heavenlies, is seated at the right hand of the Father. In a great study in the, in the book of Hebrews about how Jesus is our great high priest and how a better sacrifice, a better high priest because of who he is and the, 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 the sacrifice that he paid. Finishing up the chapter, chapter in verse 22, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Again, you notice here in verse 22, Behold, the man has become one of us. in that plural nature, the plural singularity of God. And, but here, you, you look at that and you read that sentence and it sounds as if, in a way, Satan's temptation was correct. That man did become like God. But it's only correct in a very twisted, satanic sense. God doesn't know evil because he is evil or because he's sin. He knows good and evil because he has seen it all. He has seen everything. He knew evil when Satan rebelled against him. In comparison, man now knows evil because he's done evil. So you see the difference there. He knows evil because he has physically done it. And we see the reference here to cherubim, and again, the, 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 the inner angels. But we also see God kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden. And why did God exile Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden? Garden of Eden. Well, man has now become a sinner. And the judgment of sin, we know, is death. And the death would come much later for them. You know, physical death would come later on. But it is a reality for them and for us all. And, and if Adam and Eve were to stay in the garden, 
and eat of the tree of life, they would forever be in the state that they're in. The state of being disconnected to God. Excuse me, but God does not want man to live forever in his sin. God wants you to live forever with him. So he kicks them out of the garden and he puts a cherubim to guard the garden as one day the Savior would come and deliver mankind from the penalty of sin. See, God sent his son, the promised one from Genesis 3.15, to pay the penalty man could not pay themselves. And one day our flesh will die. The question is, has our spirit been reborn? When we accept Jesus into our life as Savior and say, Yes, Jesus, I thank you for the sacrifice for my sins. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died for my sins and rose again. Be my Lord and Savior. When we do that, our spirit becomes alive. Our spirit becomes alive and we are reborn spiritually. It is because of Jesus that our spirit is born and is alive. And we now get to enjoy the fellowship with God that only Adam and Eve got to enjoy, and they lost. And now it's been restored because of the work of Jesus, the promised one from Genesis 3.15. And as we close up this session, I want to, at the end of these recordings, and uh, I didn't do it to the, to the first um, couple, but I want to start from here because of the, the chapter that it's, that it's on. And I want to try to continue, maybe not every single class, but specifically this one, and I'll try to do as many uh, as we can. But personal application questions where I can, I can end this message where a time where you can uh, ask questions and allow the Lord to, to, to reveal and penetrate your heart. The first one is, when do you find yourself most vulnerable to Satan's attacks? When? Is there a certain time? And what do you do or don't do to stop them? Because we need to be aware. We need to be aware of the things of the enemy. And we need to be aware of his tactics. So when are you most vulnerable? And then what do you do when you find yourself tempted? Or what do you don't do? And build and, and answer those questions and, 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 and build uh, and pray and build uh, defenses, you know, and allow the Lord to... Um, Put, write, your, write his word on your heart so you do not sin against him. Number two, in what ways do you find yourself living your life like Frank, Frank Sinatra saying, I did it my way? In what ways do you find yourself living your life your way and disregarding the instruction giver in the law of God? The instruction giver of God, how, where do you find yourself living your way and not according to his law? Not that we are saved or anything by, by obeying the law, but we still should seek his, his word and seek his guidance and seek his instructions. In what ways do you find yourself possibly unteachable? In what areas are you not um, following his word? Thirdly, and I asked it earlier, how do you walk with God? What does that look like for you? How and when and what aspect are you intimately walking with the Lord in your daily life? And that closes Genesis chapter 3. I just want to take a moment and pray for, pray for us. And uh, hopefully, Lord willing, this will continue in our, in our hearts as we as we continue to walk with him. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that you have forgiven our sins, that you have come and you have crushed the enemy's head, that you are you have fulfilled scripture and given us an opportunity to be restored to a relationship with you, to be restored to our time of connection with you, that you have allowed us an opportunity for our spirits to be reborn. And that means, Lord, that we get to spend eternity with you starting now and continuing on for eternity, Lord. Even though our flesh may decay and our physical body may, may, may die, 
Lord Jesus, we know that our spirit lives because of who you are and because you have conquered death. We thank you, Jesus. We pray that you give us strength and give us words by the power of your spirit to stand against the enemy and allow, him, allow you to fight the battle of, against the enemy, Lord. Because we know in you we are more than conquerors. In you we're able to stand against him. Because of the armor that you have given us, Lord, we're able to stand in Christ in the promise that the enemy will flee because he has no power over you. We thank you, Jesus, for those truths, and may we walk and enjoy the reality of them. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.